Continuing the updates across Onigashima, a few key players received some focus. Unexpected players, but ones worthy of the attention all the same. Hello, my Nakamatachi, this is Joy Girl with a review of Chapter 1006 of One Piece, The Honorable Hyogoro the Flower. Starting with the cover page, taking a break from fan requests, this week gave us the display of Oda's artistic style by presenting the glorious colour spread of Kaido and his officers. The diversity in character design and the amount of detail all on show in one spread is just amazing. Starting the chapter with this, I was reminded again about what a tough battle the Alliance has in front of them, which judging by the chapter, we do certainly see what's at stake and how much is on the line. And with that, let's move on to the chapter itself. So, another character title this week, following Demon Child last week, and the third character name title in Onigashima, with the first of course being Chapter 1000, which was Straw Hat Luffy, and it wouldn't surprise me if this trend continues as they focus on individual players during the war. First thing I would like to mention about this chapter is the paneling. Lately, Wano has been very busy with its paneling, but this week felt like your usual manga paneling. There were no double spreads, but I found the details much easier to follow. Which was handy because this chapter gave us a number of updates within the dome. We got to see what's happening in a lot of different areas, and I think this was very well done because it made the chapter feel longer. The focus on the rooftop scenes, whilst cool with a lot of action, felt also very contained at times. Personally, I like this transition in moving away from the battle and going into some story progression. I feel like Oda is carefully managing this so as not to overwhelm the readers. So let's discuss the focus of this chapter in order from the least amount of screen time to the most. Starting with Yamato's group, where Yamato is playing whack-a-mole with the Beast Pirates on the performance floor, which is actually where the majority of this chapter took place. Something I noticed about this panel with Yamato and Shinobu was that all of Yamato's opponents seem to be facing the other direction, running away as if to suggest that they are all aware of and scared of Yamato's strength because the only beast pirates who seem positioned to fight are those facing against Shinobu. It's such a subtle detail of Oda's, but one that suggests Yamato's impressive strength. We saw that the group has been spotted by Bao Hung, who proceeds to reveal to everyone that Momonosuke is hiding inside Yamato's clothes, as well as the fact that they have left the sealed storeroom. They then go up the stairs as per Yamato's instructions, but I can't be sure whether they went west of the performance floor, which I believe leads to the Right Brain Tower, or east, which is where the Pleasure Hall is. If I have to guess, the Right Brain Tower is where Frankie and Sasaki are still fighting, and Yamato recently left that scene with Frankie, so I'd say that they go to the Pleasure Hall on the east, because we haven't been to that location since Big Mom was shown getting changed there. Like I said in the last chapter review, I still think that they will end up in the treasure repository where the nine scabbards are currently. Another route that they may be taking is towards the entrance of the castle. I'm not sure on this because I don't quite understand the layout of the skull dome, but it's possible that the stairs lead towards the entrance. Shinobu's words in asking about a less visible route may be referring to what an open area the entrance would be. And if this is where they're heading, they would come across Carrot and Wanda, whom we'll get to in just a moment. Yamato's directions and Shinobu's response makes me think that this might result in a showcase of Yamato's greater intel. Though he has been portrayed to be a formidable fighter which I have thoroughly enjoyed, I'm also waiting to see more instances of his deeper insight into the workings of the Beast Pirates in assisting the Alliance, similar to how we found out about the name of the Marys last chapter through Yamato. Which brings us to the next update of Sanji, the Straw Hat chef deciding on whether to go help Kinemon or Momonosuke's group. Sanji does end up deciding on something, but we never get to see what this was in this chapter. It's nice to see the continuation of Sanji's character development. His mind is always on how he can be most useful and who he needs to help the most. Like last week, it again goes back to his words from Enya's lobby, that they each should do what they can. Now, I feel like Sanji might make his way to the sealed storeroom to go help Momonosuke. If we know Sanji, it's likely that he will think Momo and Shinobu will need more help than 9 grown strong samurais, especially since he doesn't know of Yamato's own abilities. Obviously, they will be no longer there when Sanji arrives, but on his way he could run into the performance floor where Marco is fighting two Yonko commanders, which we will get to later. These are just guesses as I'm unsure on which way these characters are actually going, and I very much like the mystery that's been set up here. I'm hoping for another callback to Enya's lobby, where we see the return of the hunter. 
Given the context that we're currently fighting the Beast Pirates, who will the Hunter hunt this time? Next, we get an update on Onigashima itself, as the island is approaching the flower capital. I appreciated this panel and the little reminder of how much is at stake and the time limit that the Alliance needs to be mindful of. Then we move on to the entrance, where Perospero has already defeated both Carrot and Wanda, who have now reverted back to their original forms. Add that to the list of off-screen battles in this arc. So seeing the result of this match, and with Perospero's words, perhaps everything that was happening upstairs on the rooftop, what with all the elemental attacks, was what shrouded the full moon, in turn causing the Minks to lose their Sulong powers. I wonder how it works exactly. Would they have reverted out of their Sulong forms entirely, or were they transforming back and forth depending on the visibility of the moon? These are the sort of questions that we're left with when we don't actually get to witness the fight on screen. And I can imagine the fight being extended in the anime. I'm picturing Perispara's candy spears raining down on the mix, which is quite the brutal image. You gotta give credit to Perispero on this one though. Being able to take on two mink warriors and walking away without having sustained much damage is quite an impressive showcase of his abilities. Also, although a villain, his words to Carrot here were sort of relatable. From the point of view of the Charlotte family, they were the victims of trespassers in their homes. <laughs> if we don't take into account their evil plot against the Vinsmoke family, I guess. Anyways, Perispero for now is working with the Beast Pirates, or at least against the Alliance, and has now also ended up on the performance floor to see an exhausted Marco, but it's not time to get to that yet. More on that later. The fact that Carrot and Wanda lost, and on top of that, off screen as well, makes me think that we will be seeing more of them later. Carrot especially. Maybe it's just me being sentimental, but Carrot's objective is to avenge Pedro's death, and so for her to fail with such little focus, surely we're gonna see more of Carrot. The next scene is where the title man himself is currently at. So in chapter 1005, we saw Hyogoro back in his old form from his younger days, and I was wondering if this is some sort of power that he's always had, where he's just able to revert back to his old younger self. If so, I thought it was strange that he didn't use this back in Udon prison, but then I thought, uh, maybe he just didn't have enough energy due to not eating properly in prison. But the explanation behind this is that this is actually very temporary and outside of his control because it's the result of being exposed to Queen's virus and is actually using what's left of his life force. Now, I really want to see more of Hyogoro's backstory after seeing this. He looked mad impressive this chapter, and knowing that in the past Kaido tried to recruit him to his crew, so you really just have to question how strong he really was. Was he as strong or at least close to Odin? Because if he was and he had joined Odin, it's hard not to give them a good chance of winning back then. I mean, he made easy work of his opponents this chapter, even swiftly taking down the entirety of the Mimawari Gumi in one attack. That one sword style reminds me of how Zoro first used Shishi Sonson back in Alabasta. Hyokoro's pose in this chapter is reminiscent to Zoro's stance prior to delivering his attack. Hyokoro was so impressive that everyone thinks that they won't be able to stop him and that he would wipe out the entire floor if he turns into an ice demon. Everyone, including Queen, who tried to attack Hyogoro before being interrupted by Marco, but hey, it's still not time to discuss that, but I do promise we are close and we'll get to that in a bit. I was surprised to see Hogoro being the title character of focus of a chapter, but I'm so glad that we got it. The panel of him post-attack also reminded me of the Buddhist deity Akala, the Wisdom King known as the Immovable Lord due to his ability to withstand carnal temptations. It's fitting that Hogoro took out the Mimawari Gumi, whom as samurais of Wano, who protected Orochi and now Kaido, can be considered traitors to their country, who chose to secure only their safety and prosperity. This Akala reference also seems to be present in Hyogoro's attack. Flaming Hair of Holy Rage Akala is known to be a wrathful god, and so the term Holy Rage seems to be a nod to this influence in Hyogoro's character. Apart from the impressive showing of strength, I also felt quite emotional reading his words to Odin, especially regarding the scabbards. As someone who has lived as long as he has, having witnessed the early days of Odin and his rowdy bunch of followers, and then suffered as much as he has following Odin's death, his words just felt so poignant and added a lot of unexpected heart to this chapter. Hyogoro's words where he said that he found a new apprentice, referring to Luffy of course, and that he's sure we will see a new dawn. Now, this new dawn, whilst not obvious, is perhaps also a reference to Luffy and the light that he brings. 
and you may already know what I'm gonna say next, but please take a fraction of your time to watch my theory video on the Nine Shadows in Toki's Prophecy and why Luffy is the dawn in this scenario. Back to this chapter and sticking with Hyogoro, whilst this review is not over, let's talk about the chapter's ending of Hyogoro accepting his fate. And this had been foreshadowed before, such as when Hyogoro promised the master that he would deal the finishing blow if it came to it, as well as this chapter itself when Hyogoro was actually referring to himself this time. So it really shouldn't have come as a surprise, but the ending still didn't fail in making me very emotional. Though it's important to note that it isn't over for Hyogoro yet. Speaking of which, now this... This is one of those moments which I imagine is going to be tricky to handle from an author's perspective. So I'm really interested in what Oda will decide to do with this one. Does he kill Hyogoro off? If he does, what does this mean for Chopper's image as a doctor who wasn't able to make an antidote in time to save an important figure in the Alliance? In saying that, I think building a character and executing his death could have a positive effect on the progression of the story. Of course, this will have an impact on Luffy's motivation as someone who spent some time and was trained by Hogoro, but also an impact on Chopper's character. For now in Onigashima, Chopper doesn't have a clear role beyond creating an antidote to stop the virus, but having Hogoro die here in front of the young doctor could serve as a catalyst to Chopper's role in the arc. He could be so angered by what happened and perhaps engage Queen in combat. No, I don't expect Chopper to take down a Yonko commander by himself, but they could at least have a quick clash which could perhaps end with the young doctor fighting someone else. Or another thing is that this could add more motivation for him for let's say when Luffy is brought to the brink of death by Kaido. What happened to Hyogoro could serve as Chopper's motivation to ensure to keep his captain alive. There are currently a lot of cliffhangers as Oda keeps changing the location of the battle on a chapter by chapter basis, but I wouldn't mind if this one is the first thing that we see resolved. I'm really interested in seeing how Oda is going to handle Hyogoro's character. Now for the main event. Let's talk about the man himself, Marco the Phoenix. Man oh man was he impressive in this chapter taking on not one, but two Yonko commanders worth over a billion bellies simultaneously as he said so himself. Now this really put Whitebeard's crew's strength in perspective, perhaps because of his initial introduction and the fact that we've seen what other Yonko commanders can do in the likes of Katakuri, Kraka, and even Jack, it's easy to forget how much of a veteran Marco is in this game. I know he was very impressive in the Marineford arc, clashing and holding his own against the Admirals, not to forget that he was mentioned by the Gorosei as one of the candidates who had a real shot in defeating Blackbeard with Whitebeard's crew, mentioned alongside only the Yonko. But it's still so undeniably impressive seeing him handle two Yonko commanders from the strongest crew in the world with such composure. Marco's stock just keeps on rising as the story in Wano progresses taking on Big Mom alone early in the arc, and now what he's doing in this chapter. I really want to see this guy on the rooftop and join in the battle against Kaido. I mean, I wouldn't count out King and Queen though, as they have yet to use their hybrid form whilst Marco is already in his, but just about everything Marco in this chapter makes me think that he should be getting some more Yonko action, which feels inevitable, and I certainly can't wait to see it. Overall, I think this was another great chapter with a good balance of action and suspense as well as an unexpected injection of emotions. Adding in some heartfelt scenes through Hyogoro was a beautiful way for Oda to tie down the chapter which was otherwise full of updates. In saying that, the updates across Onigashima was illuminating and has me equally excited as the battle on the rooftop for the rest of the arc to unfold. Whilst the fight against Kaido is certainly the main card, there are so many players involved here and it's only right that they get some deserved attention. And that brings us to the end of the chapter review, but do feel free to stick around for my reaction. Please leave your thoughts on this chapter and how you think things will progress from here by leaving a comment below. Please also subscribe if you haven't already for more One Piece discussions. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon. Hello my Nakamantachi and welcome to the land of Wano. Wait, uh, I don't think it really fits the sort of mood of what's happening in the battle right now, so. Okay, much better. Brought to you live from Onigashima. What is Kaido's hybrid form? And who is the mystery figure helping out the scabbards? And will we find all of this out in chapter 1006?
All right, let's begin. Ooh, okay. So the cover story is actually a color spread. That is awesome. Seeing all of um, Kaido's top commanders, you know, his calamities and then the Tobiropo all around him, it really just portrays how diverse and unique Oda's designs are. I mean, look at just the range. And I'm loving how Oda is drawing on the, um, like, Japanese designs for that background, for the red and black stripes in the back. It feels very reminiscent of, um, of old Japanese designs, you know, of their old flag, for example. This is so cool. All right, let's get to the chapter itself. Chapter title, The Honorable Hyogoro the Flower. Okay, so it seems like this chapter is going to focus on Hogoro. Um, that's pretty unexpected. Okay, I wonder what we're going to get. So starting in the performance floor, Bao Huang's used her ability to um, locate Yamato and Momonosuke and Shinobu. And oh, look at Yamato. Bam! Pew. Okay, so it seems like um, the Marys can... It's almost like they have x-ray vision. Or is it just maybe they can just make out the outline? of Momonosuke, but still, the fact that Marys can zoom in, you know, to see such level of detail from them, that sort of distance, I mean, it speaks a lot to how advanced Kaido's technology is. So the Marys are being used again to broadcast um, sort of locations throughout Onigashima. This time, it's Sanji on the receiving end. Um, and look at him, shaking the beast pirate. Where are they? <laughs> um. Ooh, okay, and then a nice panel of um, Onigashima itself just floating in the air. We gotta remember that Kaido's devil fruit power is still in play here. Okay, moving on to another scene and the entrance. Oh, that is, oh, that is brutal. Carrot and Wanda are out of the fight. It seems to be because of the full moon that's not as visible because of all the clouds, it seems like, or some sort of smoke in the air. And oh, poor Carrot. Still thinking of Pedro. I wasn't expecting the fight to occur off screen and to finish off screen. I would have thought we at least get to see some sort of um, awesome moment where the minks transform into their Sulong forms and even if Perispero ended up being the victor, I still would have imagined that we got to see some of the action that goes on. And maybe that means we'll get to see it another time. That's so cruel. Look at Perispero just holding her, just teasing her like that. And just, oh. And the way they've just thrown her. Pick on someone your own age. That's that's brutal. Um, back to the performance floor. Okay, so it seems like even though Marco's flames were able to help the samurai in, I guess, ward off and keep their ice oni um, forms at bay, it's using up a lot of their physical stamina. Poor Chopper, he's, you know, trying to keep himself in check as he's madly getting the antidotes ready. Oh, good old trusty Chopper. Okay, so we get to see the Beast Pirates. They're the exact opposite. They don't want any sort of trouble. They don't want any sort of risk, any sort of difficulty when it comes to fighting. And oh, yes, yes. Look at that. Look at Drake and Chogoro. Okay, that is not a pairing that I was expecting to see, but that is, that is so cool. Drake's in his hybrid form. And oh, look at Chogoro. And look at him just stepping, he's stepping on top of a beast pirate as well. That was unexpected from Hyogoro. I mean, we did see him in his um, form last chapter. Oh, the shivers of excitement. Hyogoro is loving this. He gets to revert to his old, strongest self, you know, in the midst of battle. So it seems that the explanation behind the reason why he's able to revert to his younger self is actually because of the interaction between the, um, between the virus. Okay, that's a pretty cool, um, that's a good workaround that we've got there. I guess this does mean, though, that him um, maintaining this form is probably burning up more of his life force. Like, such a contrast between the Alliance and the Beast Pirates. You know, Hogoro willing to give his whole life, use up his entire life force um, for the sake of the Alliance and for the sake of this raid, whereas the Beast Pirates are like, mm -mm, I'm not risking that. Oh, 
And now he's saying it again, that if he reverts to the ice only form, that they have to end um, that they have to end his life, you know, that he doesn't want to be a figure who ends up killing people on his own side. And it's a good callback that we have um, seeing that Omasa is there as part of the Yakuza leaders, because you know, some chapters ago we saw Omasa making that sort of same determination, and Hyogoro said back then, like, no, don't do this, um, just hold on, and if if it gets to that state, I'll do it myself. And now it's the, on the reverse, and Hogoro is actually saying the same thing to them. So heavy, so deep. The determination in Hogoro's eyes are clear, you know? And, oh, but we get to see him. We're seeing just how strong he is. And, oh, flaming hair of holy rage. Wow. Oh my goodness. He's taken out the whole Mimawari Gumi in just one attack. Look at that! That is so magnificent. And I love the flames all around him, sort of an extension of his hair. He really does actually look like a flower. You know, he looks like a crazy flower of like of just magnificent power. And his design along with his um with his attack name, Holy Rage. Like a few months ago, I made a video about Kaido as um, Kaido as well as all of the Yonko um, possibly being influenced by the Wisdom Kings. And of course, Hyogoro said in one chapter when he was looking at Luffy that, hey, Luffy reminds me of a Wisdom King. And when I was doing the research for that, I came across one of the gods. I think it was um, Akala? Um, I was actually thinking, oh, he actually looks like Hyogoro. I think it's Akala. Look at that, he's just still going at it. Just, oh, guns blazing sword blazing <laughs> oh, okay and we're seeing a bit of inner monologue and so you know it's serious when we get some insight and we get to see a character's inner monologue okay so seems like Kyogoro is thinking back and thinking to Odin you know it's a very bittersweet um, emotion that Kyogoro is feeling now you know it seems like he's had uh, sort of a hint of regret throughout his life, wondering if he had been there that day when Odin took on Kaido, whether things would look different now. But you know, whatever's happened, happened. And he recognizes this because he says like, look, yeah, maybe things would have been different, maybe things wouldn't have, uh, maybe we would have defeated Kaido, maybe we wouldn't have. And you know what, it doesn't matter because um, the scabbards, you know, your scabbards, your retainers have carried on your will and they're pulling off this raid in your name and, oh, um, and, you know, he's happy to be a part of that experience now. You can't dwell on the past and think, you know, what could have happened um, because what they've got now would have made Odin proud. It's certainly making him proud. And you can see Hyogoro thinking this as he's transforming into his only form. Still, you know, you could see the fangs come out. But it's it's such a clear sign that, you know, like he said earlier in the chapter, that he's always had a good grip on his um on his mentality. And it really just goes to show uh, Hyogoro's inner strength. Odin's done a really good job of sliding that this emotional, this heavy emotional piece in, in the middle of the um of the chapter. And to go back to sort of what's happening in Onigashima right now, um, look at him, he's just doing his thing and is making so much impact so much so that they're saying he's gonna wipe out the entire floor and Queen has to get involved oh no don't do that it's gonna send him to the end of his life force oh okay Phoenix brand oh Marco has joined in yes Marco's like hey I'm your opponent oh that is glorious <laughs> If you want to get to my friends, you're going to have to get through me first. And look at that giant beam. And look, Marco's fine. He's dodged it. Oh, he's facing off both of them at the same time. I mean, we saw that in one of the other updates. But this, oh, I was wondering whether we were going to get to see this. I was hoping that it wouldn't be off screen. And look, we get it. This is so cool. Look at that. Oh, King's just sliced off one of his wings. And it doesn't seem like... No, it's fine. Look at Marco's um, still using his powers. What a stylish use of his ability as well. It just looks so cool. You know, it's so smooth. Yes. 
I mean, we were always expecting an aerial combat between King and Marco, but I was not expecting that Marco would take on both of Kaida's commanders at once. I mean, that is truly fantastic. Look at and another attack, Bluebird. Wow, so fast as well. And look at that jump. Whop! Whoa. Oh, yes! Quinn looks like he's just like narrowly escaped, but like, no, you get the claw, you get Marco's claws, his phoenix claws. Yeah, crane talents. It is up. He's got his moves. Oh, my goodness. That is, that's three attacks that we got. Look at his words saying, you know, it's tough work. Like having to hold off two of the commanders, you know, they're worth over a billion belly. Um, but as he's saying that, it doesn't look like he's having so much trouble. Okay. And, hmm, all right, though, but Paris Paris joined in as well, or he looks like he's joining in. Oh, no way. So Marco's going to face off three. Oh, okay, but we cut back to um, the samurais on the performance floors. And, yeah, it seems like their stamina has run out now. I mean, you know, um, that's incredible how long that they've held off. And, oh, no, oh, okay. And Hyogoro's, Hyogoro's just, um, Hyogoro's near the end of his life as well and he can feel it he knows that the ice oni is taking over and yeah he, as he says he just wants to end it this way you know oh you know what a boss you know he wants to decide his own fate he's not gonna let himself be used as a as one of um as a petty little device that queen's conjured up you know there's so much there's so much strength in that so the last line that, you know, here ends the life of Hyogoro the flower with no regrets, that says so much and it speaks so much um, about what we were discussing earlier in this chapter, about how, you know, at some point in his life he may have actually felt regrets, you know, wondering, why didn't I go help Oda? Why was I not there that day? Um, but here in his last moments, you know, witnessing everything that he has, um, you know, what with the scabbards, with Luffy and the rest of the Alliance, everyone stepping up um, and putting their all in this fight. And for him to be able to say that, you know, he also put his all into this fight. And which he did, you know, he was fighting until the end. Um, and yeah, look at him, his, that last panel, you can clearly see how much the Oni form has started to take over was able to contain himself for this long. Just speaks so much, again, about his determination and his just raw willpower. And, oh, it's a very bittersweet ending. And so it is another cliffhanger that we're ending on, but there's no break next week. And maybe Oda will actually just show us what happens next. Oh, man, that's... What a way to end the chapter. Okay, all right, bye.